Welcome back, everybody. Corey used bloody history. Continuing. Um, it looks like today we're going to be able to wrap up uh, Weisberg's Lauren Hall stuff. I've gone through the remainder of the files, and it appears as though a lot of it is just uh, duplicate newspaper articles and stuff like that. So uh, I do have some articles I want to get through today. Uh, they're not really, they're not crucial, but they're interesting. Uh, but I want to get through all the remaining uh, actual documents and stuff that he has on Lauren Hall uh, before we move on to tomorrow's uh, show, which will be more on Lauren Hall, but it will be in the form of a file titled Lawrence Howard. So that one comes from a new collection that we will discuss tomorrow. But uh, moving on, so... This document appears to be a City of Miami inter-office memo dated November 1st, 1963. Subject Jerry Patrick, address of 2450 Northwest North River Drive, Apartment K. That was back when Miami was actually really nice back in the 60s. Oh, my God. I would have loved to have visited Miami in the 60s. As instructed by Detective Sergeant C.H. Sapp, I met above subject at 201 Southwest 21st Court, Apartment Number 2. Subject stated that one man, Lauren Hall, stole two rifles from his apartment last night. One rifle being a Jungle uh, Carbine, number R5841. The other being a Savage 22 rifle with a scope. Hall was seen as he left the subject's apartment carrying the two rifles. Recently in California, Hall also stole a Johnson 30-06 from this subject. Hall is staying with Cuban male Manolo Aguiar at 829 Southwest 9th Avenue. Uh, then it has some, looks like, biographical information on uh, it's Manuel Aguiar Alvarez is his full name. Uh, a number one two four zero four eight zero three looks like a driver's license number. Date of birth June third twenty nine. I went to great lengths back in my early days trying to prove that Mister Manolo Aguiar was uh, the short tramp, but no, I was wrong. For a long time, I was wrong on that one. Uh, he lives at four fifty eight Southwest. Um, can't tell what that apartment is, and a bunch of other biographical stuff. Five foot nine, hundred eighty pounds. That guy ain't no 180 fucking pounds bullshit. 150 tops. Scar on hairline. Um, yeah, a bunch of other miscellaneous stuff. So Manolo Aguiar, he was another one of these guys who was tied up with these Interpen guys down in uh, Jerry with Jerry Hemming and all these. I should do a show on Interpen one day just to cover all the names associated with it. You know, we've mentioned some of them, Howard K. Davis, uh, Ralph Elmer Slafter. He's an interesting one because I thought he was the short tramp, too, for a while. All right. So, yeah, like uh, there's been some interesting stuff when I was going through the Interpen. I kept trying to connect these Interpen guys to the assassination. I just couldn't fucking do it. Um, Hall, Howard and Seymour is it. And maybe Hemming. I don't know. Hemming, I haven't been able to place anywhere. I don't really think that picture we know of him is actually him uh, in Dallas. On November 22nd, I can't say for sure, but um, he definitely was not a shooter. He definitely wasn't involved in the actual execution of the assassination. Was he involved in any planning? Who knows? I bet he figured out, uh, and we're talking about Jerry Hemming, by the way. I think uh, we Her Hemming figured out that they were going to kill the president and was like, oh, I'm going to I'm get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I don't want nothing to do with this. I'm kind of, that's, that's the feeling I'm getting from Jerry Hemming, and I've always gotten that feeling from him. All right, moving on. And I tried to put these in uh, chronological order, in date order, to make more sense about Hall, his whereabouts, and his uh, attempts to evade uh, testifying at the uh, grand jury of Clay Shaw prior to the trial. Um, so this one was from around, uh, this one's from September of 64. Uh, Leon F. Brown reported 923-64 of Hall interview of 916, says he had a beard when he visited Odeo. Okay, so remember, going back to the Sylvia Odio incident, it is 100 fucking percent Hall, Howard, and Seymour who went to Sylvia Odio's, okay? That's unquestionable. The idea that fucking idiots today still doubt whether it was them is unfucking believable And the proof in the pudding is from the Harry H. Whidbey FBI report dated 9-16-64 and 9-23-64, 
and 926.64. Three reports. Three reports, okay, um, that are very important in showing that they were, it was those three guys who were there. Because Hall, Hall admits it. He's a, he's a dumb fuck. So at the time, uh, Hall, uh, Howard, they're just still trying to make it seem like William Seymour wasn't with them, and they keep trying to say it was Celio, Celios Albus, but it, it wasn't. It was not Celios Albus. It was William Seymour. FBI, September 26, 1964, Miami report on the fifth page, part of which was eliminated in the copy sent to the commission under a description of uh, Celio Castro, no beard or mustache as of September 1963. Yeah, Celios Albus was Celios Albus Castro, if I'm not mistaken. No related to no relation to Castro Castro. Um, but he was not involved in any of this shit. He doesn't pop up anywhere except in uh, Lauren Hall's alibis. Uh, would be repeated, quote, had Beard in September 63 on page 10. Brown re-interviewed Hall 920, also reported under date of 923. Okay, that's why there was some confusion because I thought it was 924, but it turns out it was 920. Also reported as 923, and then the report came out on 926. So those, that's some clarification on the dates there. Last page concludes, quote, both he and Howard, Howard wore a full, full beard at the time. Seymour confirmed that Howard had a beard when interviewed by FBI agent Calvin Evans, 918-64. Um, the Hall story, Yates Odeo, 61269, Harold Weisberg. Uh, rereading the Yates, and we'll get to who Yates is here momentarily. Rereading the Yates 62867 letter to Garrison brings to mind several of the continuing problems. Who is truthful and why do the people involved dissemble when there is no superficial reason for it? On the face of it, uh, seemingly voluntary, voluntarily, Yates wrote Garrison a long letter, giving no specific reason for the timing of his writing. He several times refers to his reading of the Warren report. The context is that his reading of the report inspired the letter. Well, he waited almost three years, which is too long a time in itself to appear likely. Internal evidence is that reading of whitewash, too, is the immediate cause. And the internal content of the letter attributes uh, to the report what is not in it and what is exclusively in World War II, WW2. So on motive, Yates lies. Example, the FBI showed Odeo only old pictures. Uh, possibly in other respects, uh, Yates is both truth truthful and forthright, but I am inclined to believe he is holding back at best. Hall did not stay with Yates as long as he did blabbermouth that Hall is without saying much more. There are sharp contradictions between what each says. Here I compare Yates' letter with my lengthy interviews with Hall, of which I presume copies have been read. There is no doubt that Hall is a liar. Some of the contradictions can be resolved against Hall because it was to his interest to lie about them. Example, the number of times he was in New Orleans. But I also feel that some of what Yates is holding back may be significant. Save for one thing. There is nothing in his letter that does not flow from WWII. That is his reference to the taking over of Haiti uh, as a point for attack on Cuba. And this is of current interest because of the involvement of some of the mercenaries of this group in the current Haitian adventure, as forecast to me by Hemming, 1031-68. Also, I recall no other reference to use the Bay of Pigs, uh, the Bay, uh, the big, uh, to use the Big Pine Key. In other, uh, in, an, in another letter that is seemingly factual, Yates slips over a few things that would interest me. Example: uh, his place of work and its nature. It is indicated as medical only. Hall said he was an oxygen technician and believed he had worked at Parkland. Uh, another, the nature of his firearms act conviction. Hall said that he was an expert marksman whose garage was loaded with various explosives, who had every conceivable weapon, etc., and was radical right in orientation. Yates contradicts Howard also on his presence in Dallas in September of 1963. As I recall Howard's statements to me, he places a man who seems to be Howard there, deliberately or otherwise. He goes far to confirm WW2. And the immediate question is, uh, does he go out of his way to do it and for a purpose? Or is it entirely factual? Uh, if Yates is right, there is heavy confirmation of Odeo here. One thing that is surprising and pertinent is his emphasis on Hall writing Manolo Ray. Um, okay, so let me just clarify here. Manolo Ray is not Manolo Aguiar. Okay, two different people. 
Uh, this is consistent with the statements and representations made to Odio, but inconsistent with Hall's own rightist orientation. Uh, his not mailing the letter is consistent with a put-on. I find it very interesting either way. At this point, I can do very little with it, but I solicit thought and opinion. Does anyone have anything else pertinent? Yates is a friend of Hall's who Hall stayed with for some time, and then he ends up writing a letter to Jim Garrison and all this stuff. So that's what that is. Moving on. A confidential memorandum, March 20th, 68, to Jim Garrison from Stephen Jaffe, investigator, reference interview with Lauren Hall. So here we go. we got six pages of Lauren Hall stuff. Uh, on March 12, 68, at 7.30 p.m., I met Lauren Eugene Hall at his motel. He was registered at the Hollywood Hills Motel, 7140 Sunset Boulevard, room number seven. We met there and subsequently went to Tana's restaurant, where we discussed the following information and received the FBI reports regarding himself, the Sylvia Odeo incident, William Seymour, and Lawrence Howard. Hall stated that the FBI report dated 9-23-64 was inaccurate in its mention of one Kiki Ferrer as being the person he got in touch with. He stated that he was in touch with a Cuban named Herrera. Herrera, according to Hall, had been in the anti-Castro group designated the 2506 Brigade and that his father owned a sugar plantation near Mexicali, Mexico. Hall stated that it was Herrera, not Ferrer, who was employed by the Texas Optical Company in Dallas, Texas. Hall stated that he had, uh, knew he had never seen Sylvia Odio because he has seen a photograph of her with her four children shown to him by Jerry Cohen of the Los Angeles Times and Lawrence Schiller of either Life Magazine and Los Angeles Times or who knows what. He stated he could not recall if it was Cohen or Schiller because both men had visited him and showed him photographs. Hall stated that during his interrogation by S.A. Uh, Leon F. Brown, he had been asked if he had met Sylvia Odio in Dallas. He said that it was possible he had, but that he had no recollection of it. The agent then asked him if he could have been at Magellan Circle, Apartment A, and Hall repeated that it is possible because he had visited people trying to secure funds for his anti-Castro activities. He made it clear to me that he could not rule out the possibility. And for that reason, he told the agent, Brown, that it was possible. Uh, the report dated 9-23-64 is incorrect when it said Hall stated that this Cuban woman lived because at no time did he indicate that as a fact. The FBI report says, quote, Hall said that Dallas resident made available $5,000, which Hall put up for bail, and then they were released. Hall stated that he knew nothing of the bail at the time of their release. He was under the assumption that the charges had been dropped at the time of their release. After their release, they were taken to a young attorney's office in Dallas. Hall had never seen this man before and does not remember his name. The attorney said they should go straight to the YMCA where Lester Logue had arranged a room for them. Consider this in the light of their having been signed in as Hall and Howard. Hall stated that he knows Kiki Ferrer well, has had dinner at his home twice in Miami, Florida, and that Kiki will have no part in his brother Rolando's activity. Uh, Kiki is a dentist, Hall says, and is not interested in participating in the anti-Castro activities, although he is in sympathy with the activities. Kiki helped indirectly, but was never in direct contact with the activities. Hall stated that while the report indicates that he mentioned the Isle of Pines, neither he nor Agent Brown ever mentioned the Isle of Pines during the entire interrogation. Hall also told me that until our meeting, he had never seen these documents. Hall stated that in the document, which quotes him as having recalled that, quote, the three of them, Hall, Howard, and Seymour, had gone to the apartment of a Cuban woman, quote, is totally inaccurate, as the three of them were never in Dallas together. Hall had been there with Howard at a separate time. He was there with Seymour, but never with both at the same time. See page 3, 92364, dictated 91764. Hall continued that where the report says that, quote, they had been in Dallas about three or four days when he and Seymour were arrested and held by police. That is false. Not only were the three of them not there at the same time, but that the arrest of himself and Seymour took place on the morning after the evening they arrived. Uh, they had arrived about 8 p.m. and were arrested about 9 a.m. the next morning, having talked to no one in the interim. Hall stated in regard to his willingness to go to New Orleans to talk to District Attorney Jim Garrison, this was now perfectly agreeable to him. He would wait until he got some of his strength back. He was discharged around the end of February 1968 from the Veterans Administration Hospital in Los Angeles on Sawtell Avenue, and until he has a doctor's clearance. He further stated that he trusted me and would agree to any arrangement we would make for this trip. Uh, he said he wanted to testify under oath and that he would cooperate in any way possible. When I asked why this had seemed to 
would be contrary to his attitude before. He said for two reasons he had fought extradition as a mat- as a material witness. First, he was visited the night before his California hearing by Lawrence Schiller, Jerry Cohen, and one other man. And they said uh, to him that he would be charged for contempt of court or perjury and thrown in jail for five years if he went to New Orleans. They told him that Garrison is some kind of nut and urged that he not go to New Orleans under any circumstances. Secondly, since his hearing had not... Uh, he had to pay $1,500 in attorney's fees and had been suddenly stricken with a serious ailment. This, he feared, might have been caused by one of Garrison's men or by someone who did not want him to testify in New Orleans. I asked Hall why his wife had such a puzzlingly negative reaction to the letter sent to him by Jim Garrison. This was the letter hand-carried to his home and to his wife by Jack Houston. He told me they had nothing but contempt for Corky because he was told by his wife that Corky had scared her with the letter. Houston had apparently presented it to her as if he was a garrison staff member. When she questioned this, uh, Houston phoned the office in New Orleans and spoke to assistant DA James Alcock, which Mrs. Hall took to be an affirmation of Houston's word of being a staff member. This frightened her further because she felt that Houston had been spying on them all along and was trying to get Hall in trouble. Hall confirmed that at the time of the letter's transport, he was in the hospital, but now he had read it and its contents supported the truth that Garrison was willing to cooperate with him. He felt that now, having read the letter, having talked with Harold Weisberg, Bill Turner, Al Schwartz, the Citizens Committee of Inquiry, and myself, that he had nothing to fear in traveling to New Orleans, he not only looks forward to doing that, but he said that since reading the Turner article in Ramparts, he can fill in some important information and the identities of subjects Garrison is interested in. I showed Hall a photo of the second man in the Walking Men photograph. He could not identify this man. Later, I asked him if he ever heard the name Clinton Hampton. Hall said yes, immediately, and gave the following information. Description 40 years old in 1963, 5'5 or 5'6, uh, dark complexion. Association, Hall had met him in Miami. He said Hampton was an instructor and possibly CIA. Hall had met Hampton two times after having been referred to, uh, referred by two Cuban women, lesbians, according to Hall, in a well-known bar he frequented. And he did not give the name of the bar. Hampton uh, told Hall at the time of their meeting that he might get him in a uh, green light raid running boats for the CIA. I asked Hall whether or not he was working for Edgar Eugene Bradley, soliciting funds from Wallace for President campaign centers. I told him that the office had an anonymous call to this effect and that it seemed impossible at the time, but that we wanted to have his reaction. He said he would be the last one in the world to do a thing like that at this point because he wants to be as far away from Bradley as he possibly can. He wants no part of Bradley and states that he believes it very possible Bradley might be involved in some way in the assassination. Oh, that's fucking hilarious. Uh, this is pure speculation on his part, other than his knowledge of Bradley's acquaintances during the early part of 1963. Hall stated that he was definitely present at a meeting at uh, Clinton Wheat's Los Angeles apartment on Lafayette Place in 1963, where others present were Edgar Eugene Bradley, uh, Ed Collins, Colonel Gale, uh, and Dr. Stanley Drennan, he said that he would uh, definitely state this under oath. All right, so now we have the connection here. So for years and years and years, all the JFK research fucking idiots have been bringing up the name Edgar Eugene Bradley. I've been bringing up uh, this Dr. Stanley Drennan. Um, and obviously Edwin Collins, they've not been talking about because he's probably, um, the guy who was out with Oswald on the street corner and they never get shit right. Right. And Colonel Gale, the fucking, uh, Kennedy people never talk about either, but these people were all part of like what I would consider like the right wing, not really political establishment. They were like the right wing lobbying establishment, um, all connected to groups like the Minutemen. Um, uh, what was Robert Welch's group? John Birch Society. Um, that's where these guys come in, right? These guys are like, um, these guys are so fucking gung ho on like raising money and guns and all this stuff for Cuba. But then remember, like these guys are their forces are countered by the CIA, who funnel all the money and the weapons and all that shit to Israel. 
right? So, uh, but these guys were these guys were well aware of the assassination. Uh, Edgar Eugene Bradley was, I think, identified as one of the fake Secret Service agents uh, near the book depository at the time. Um, Edwin Collins, uh, he was de- confirmed to be an FBI informant. Uh, anybody connected to, to No Name Key was a CIA contract agent at minimum. Edwin Collins being no different, but I believe Edwin Collins was. Uh, I believe he got outed as an FBI informant and possibly responsible for Interpen getting shut down. Um, but yeah, now all these guys uh, are from Los Angeles and they're all connected to these right wing organizations and and particularly Lawrence Hall and I'm sure Lawrence Howard too. But see, Lawrence Howard's a much smarter guy. He laid he he stayed under the radar. He didn't want to be uh, he didn't want to have this stuff out in the open. Hall was too bombastic and verbose about it. I asked Hall if he had reason to believe that there was anyone who might want to get him in trouble. He said that there could be many possibilities for that. Uh, At a point later in our conversation, I asked Hall how he got along with Jerry Patrick, uh, Jerry Hemming. Uh, He said that for the most part, he'd always gotten along well with Patrick. He considers him a hell of a nice guy and thought that Patrick was his friend. When I asked if he thought Patrick might be the one who gave the tip about him being a solicitor for the Bradley Defense Fund, uh, Hall said that the only one thing would make him believe that to be a possibility. An incident occurred in 1963, which involved himself and Patrick. Uh, Patrick has sold or rather hawked a rifle uh, with Dick Hathcock, an ABC TV reporter in Los, An- in Los Angeles. Hathcock was recently uh, done television interviews with Roger Craig and I believe with D.A. Jim Garrison. The rifle remained in Hathcock's possession until a conversation between Hall and Hathcock brought out that Hathcock was going to sell the rifle to anyone he could. Hall told him that he would like to buy it from him uh, if he didn't have to keep it for Patrick. Soon after, Hall purchased the rifle from Hathcock for the sum of $50. Thereafter, when Hall was in Florida, Patrick phoned him and threatened him if he did not hand over the rifle. Hall rejected the threat. A few days later, when Hall went to a specific uh, locale um, on the beach to acquire a boat for the forthcoming raid. He was accompanied by a Cuban friend of his. While they were uh, attaching the boat to the trailer, the Cuban said, look up in that house. It's Patrick. Hall looked up but didn't see anyone. That evening, Hall and his friend were arrested by U.S. Customs officials. At that time, the customs officials told Hall that they had known about his activities from the time he picked up the boat. Someone uh, they boasted had called them at 2.30 p.m., uh, Hall said this was about the time they got the boat, so <laughs> Jerry Hemming probably ratted Hall out. At the conclusion of our meeting, Hall told me that we uh, would be in touch uh, upon his next trip in Los Angeles and that uh, he would help in any way he could. If there was anything he could do, I told him I would arrange his trip whenever he was ready. You know, I, I look at these fucking idiots who were dealing with Lauren Hall back in this day, and, like, he was fucking guilty. He was one of the shooters up on the fucking uh, sixth floor of the book depository, and so these idiots like fucking Weisberg are handling him with kick gloves. It's just driving me fucking crazy. All right, here's a letter from Harold Weisberg uh, to, it says, Dear Steve, I'm not sure who Steve is, maybe it will be uncovered. I spoke to Jim by phone for about an hour and a half last night and froze while doing it uh, from an outdoor booth in zero weather. I then worked uh, through the night trying to catch up on the uh, education so I'm kind of foggy. I think I mailed you a letter early this a.m. If I did, I forgot what to, uh, what to me is uh, significant. When I mentioned the name Wiley Yates, Jim's reaction was, oh, yes, he's been very cooperative. Turns out that on his own, Yates got in touch with Jim to give him good information on his good friend Skip Hall. He did give many details, the least likely uh, thing a genuine friend of the same political persuasion would do, unless... I've suggested to Jim that Wiley may be a cunning one and that uh, in going to Jim on his own initiative and volunteering information about Hall, he deflected attention from himself. Jim now agrees this is a possibility. He also confirms that what I got from Hall on Yates' employment and acknowledges it should be significant or could be significant. What I would like to ask is this. Have Al Schwartz phone Skip and tell him only that I asked him to call an an inquiry about how he is getting along. Nothing else. Unless the conversation goes in a way that Al might use to remind him that I said I'd like to hear from him if he has anything to say and is up to it. I think his number is 479-9375. I'd appreciate it if Al could tape it for me. 
Uh, if further, he can uh, phone the Houstons, father and son, and tell them I'd appreciate hearing from them. That would help. He could tell them I spoke to Garrison last night, and he would like to see uh, Mrs. H if she brings the files and tape with her. The Houstons uh, agree with me, as Jim does that he can be Skip's salvation unless he actually fired a bullet, uh, which we think he did not, of course. Now, how the fuck could you come to... Th this is my problem. This is my fucking biggest problem with these idiots. These Kennedy researchers are the dumbest fucking people. This guy was in contact with Lauren Hall directly, and he couldn't put two and two together. This motherfucker was on the sixth floor, okay? How did I put Lauren Hall on the sixth floor, okay? Here. Well, when you understand the cast of characters, and you understand Lawrence Howard, and you have, understand how he had a, a, a husky Latino with a pockmarked face, he had moles on his face, very distinct appearance, and he's seen by Arnold fucking Roland on the sixth floor in the sniper's nest, and he described him as having something wrong with his face as though it was marked in a particular way. And then I asked the question, how many people have we come across thus far whose face is marked in some way and is attached to a large husky fucking Latino? Only one. It's Lawrence Howard, right? So I can say with 110% certainty, Lawrence Howard was the shooter in the sniper's nest where Oswald was allegedly standing. There was one other person there to his left. Okay, Lawrence Howard had two associates, Lauren Hall and William Seymour. And where the fuck is William Seymour at this point in time? Carolyn Arnold puts him on the first goddamn floor. Okay? So who is Lawrence Howard's other cohort on the sixth fucking floor? It is Lauren Hall. It is Lauren Hall. That's how the fuck we know. And the fact they found the Johnson 30-06 rifle in Dealey Plaza, that within 24 hours they had traced back to Richard Hathcock, which is the proof that the rifle was Lauren Hall's rifle, that the FBI was investigating starting the day of the assassination. And by within 24 hours, they had complete statements from Dick Hathcock, right? So this is not rocket science, people. This is how investigations get done. Two plus two equals four. And guess what? Two plus two plus two equals six. And that's how you put together an investigation. And I don't know that they didn't have, how could they not have had the statements of, 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 of Arnold Rowland? How the fuck could he not have made the connection that Lawrence Howard is the fucking pockmarked Latino. The husky Latino with the pockmarked face. I don't understand these fucking idiots. This is what drives me fucking crazy. They have IQs of slugs. And this applies to every modern day Kennedy researcher. Every last fucking one of them. God, I hate these fucking cocksuckers who like pat themselves on the back and never solved a fucking thing. Jesus Christ. I'm getting off track here, but I'm pissed because this wasn't that fucking hard. Okay. Putting him on the sixth floor was not that fucking hard. Putting him fleeing out the building at 1233, circling commerce, and then getting into fucking Lawrence Howard's Green Nash Rambler while it's parked up on Record Street. That wasn't that fucking hard either. Where was I? All right. So uh, he spends time at McCaffrey's Bar, 714-376-2483. Messages any of these places would likely reach him. I'd also like it if when he has time talking about uh, Al Schwartz. Uh, he writes all the recent developments out for me, not only so I'd know now, but uh, he has a historical record. I think the Bakersfield area code is 905. I forgot to ask Jim last night if he'd phoned you from a clear phone uh, through Art, as he'd promised. In discussing it with him, he agreed that it would be uh, worth trying out the wings, if not the voice, of the Fat Swallow. Good name. Even if he is a player, it would be worth seeing what he does. And I have written for the Miami Pictures Hall spoke of. I'm very anxious that you uh, get and copy all the files as soon as possible and send them to me, especially the pictures. You can tell Fred that my description really excites him. Uh, I may be able to place a magazine story on the Willis 5 thing alone if he'd like. In any event, as soon as I heard from you uh, day before yesterday, I was on the phone uh, with my affirmative recommendation. If you have heard nothing, hold the Swallows uh, primaries, uh, something him, and start phoning Jim at 504-525-2375. Uh, the no AC, the New Orleans AC, until you learn one way or the other. However, never phone him there unless it's urgent. He has a phobia about phones and goes there to get away from them. The switchboard cuts all calls. I got him yesterday only because Alcock went down the hall and took him by the hand, so to speak. I know you all stay busy too, but I hope you get time to bring me up to date on any developments since my departure. Uh, tell Steve I gave Jim uh, a, a brief rundown on the 
call on the calls affair. I think that's going to be the Collins affair. And if he is interested, I'm anxious to see his reports best to all. So as you can see, when you go through these fucking letters by Weisberg, which he wrote like multiple every fucking day of his life, it seems like, um, he has a little bit of information filled with a lot of other nonsense and bullshit. So, all right, moving on. We're on item number 67, Wiley Yates. Uh, this material is as believed as what Hall says, perhaps more so, but that doesn't say enough. He persistently avoid saying where he works or in what capacity. Aha, so Wiley Yates, nobody knows what he does, right? Um, there is another coincidence with the date, I believe, the date I believe not adequately accounted for by the opening uh, that is the time something, something, something circulating in the Dallas and Texas area for the first time. I then heard from a number of people involved in the story. Where is the first extensive use of the suppressed Hall Howard material here? Uh, on next to the last page here refers to the, quote, drastic changes in Hall's appearance, making it difficult to identify the men from old photographs. I know of uh, not other point at which the use of old photographs is mentioned. Only this book letter to Jim dated six twenty three sixty seven. If could still be confidence that it's still something time he chose to write Jim. However, I think if one were to speculate about motive he might have been motivated by a desire to not be involved through Hall or to divert attention from himself aside from simple cooperativeness. The date he places Hall's old car in Dallas is inconsistent with Hall's account. He has Mayor June, Hall later uh, states in your... Uh, it seems unlikely that when they are so politically anti-something, I can't read that, that Hall was a friend of some Maslow May. This is consistent with framing him for the FBI and then something, something may sent the men to something. Uh, I can't read that. In general, uh, he has little more detail to offer, uh, not under questioning, than I think he would have had uh, with the little or no involvement he suggests he had. So Weisberg is doubting the fact that he had no involvement. I haven't come across this guy's name ever. So let's pull out the information we can on Wiley Yates, please. Um... In general, okay, so let me see. His memory is going back about five years of this, uh, of something needless record that long. The amount Hall is uh, playing around is inconsistent with that of something, something Hall or perhaps the other occasions. Okay, so Yates and Hall's timelines and stuff is different. Um, and the vehicle they're talking about, Hall owned a uh, white Pontiac station wagon that ended up breaking down and being pushed to a junkyard. I don't know if that that might be that must be the car he was talking about because it's the only car that that Hall ever had in in Dallas because the green Nash Rambo station wagon was Howard's and Hall ended up driving that back to Los Angeles after the Tidy Lady Laundry incident. Uh, his mention of his own conviction on a federal firearms violation is consistent with Hall's description of him of a gun buff who had almost every rifle who's <clears throat> something, something loaded with explosives, right? So that was the guy, this is the guy who Hall was talking about, who could split an apple at 500 feet. Hall also portrayed him as an extremist of the radical right, consistent with their friendship, and says yeah, he's an oxygen technician uh, at night uh, in, looks like, uh, in Oakland. There is no Wiley Yates listed in the 1963 Dallas directory, although there are several Yates within the... Uh, W. All right. Wiley Yates living in Dallas in 1963. Let's see if we can't find that information. Um, all right. We have another memo here. Dated 915, 1975. 
Looks like it's to JL. I don't know who that is. Um, Kevin did phone back after four hours, taped with scared, divorced, shaked up again Hall, who was hiding. Looks like the cigar picture again. He told Art nothing. I didn't know, but with a couple of dubious details that make it current, like mafia, CIA angles, etc. Uh, some seems not exactly as he told me, but close. Uh, meeting at Lester Logue's office now was discussion plot for $250,000 to off JFK and to put LBJ in. Hall is going to sue, and it looks as though Belli may handle his case. Art says, I'm to get tape, but not to let it be used. Hall says there was a time Hemming was CIA, which Art doubts. Bob Brown says he was, or Hemming told me. Ma- Ma- Mafia Miami contact man on anti-Castro plot uh, with... CIA, Hall says, was Al Martino. He has a Raul and a Hernandez, and I told Art too many common but old names that figure in stories. There are other common names not used. He is to have further interviews. Hall can't be too far away because it was not much more than an hour after interview that Art called me, and it's dated 9-15-75. No context here. All right, uh, another letter to Jim. Uh, it's obviously Jim Garrison. All the letters to Jim typically are to Jim Garrison. Dated 9 75 same date as the previous one. Title, Tatler, Lauren Hall, Art Kevin interview. Art phoned me at what for him was early morning to background and prepare him for an arranged interview with Lauren Hall at noon California time. Hall is not out of the country and is closer to L.A., than he was at uh, when at Palm Springs. Uh, Art did not mention his name, but there's no doubt, and there likewise is no doubt that if anyone was listening in, they'd have no doubt. <laughs> Art is going to tape the interview and will send me a dub. I'll not be surprised to hear from him before then. He thinks, as I do, that Hall has a fine libel action. Uh, we could use the same lawyer. If he's good, that whole story is crazy. Uh, it is a combination ripoff improvisa- improvisation of my work of 1966, 67, and 68 different trips out there, including pirated copies of the Newcomb's transcriptions of tapes of my interviews. I told Art where to check in my work before speaking to Hall and to give Hall the message that I'll be glad to help if he sues and that I think I can. I can uniquely. Tatler bought the books that contain the FBI airtight alibi of 11-22-63 for Hall. Parentheses, we have the records. Took six months to get paid. Besides, with my other knowledge, is uh, if there is anything for you to know, I'll let you know best Uh, Okay, so this is bullshit. Like, I don't know how the fuck these guys got duped, but it says, I can uniquely. Tatler bought the books that contain the FBI airtight alibi of 112263 for Hall. So the FBI has an airtight alibi of 112263 for Hall as of 1975, which is fucking hilarious because of 1978, right around the time of the HSCA. We're dealing with, uh, three years after this, after it's airtight, we're dealing with the contradiction between the fact that he was an IPCO hospital supply or whether or not he was at home with his wife. We have two different fucking stories by from Hall in 1967-68. So the idea that Weisberg would be duped by this shit is just unreal to me. All right, moving on. Here we're fast-forwarding two years to June 8th, 77, and uh, this letter is to Dear Kevin. I don't know who Kevin is. Maybe we'll find out. Dear Kevin, uh, if, as I think is possible, I... Uh, Left with seeming impoliteness yesterday, this was not my intention. I recall we were standing and talking, and then uh, Bud pulled that kid's uh, trick of tapping me on the shoulder and moving to the other direction when Hall came. Uh, He had come up to me earlier and asked uh, that we be together after the hearing, so when he and his lawyers left, I had to leave with them. Uh, We did spend some hours together later drinking and talking and doing a little reminiscing. I learned... I earned his trust more than nine years ago. Uh, I am one of only two who write of whom this is true. Uh, The other is Art Kevin. I've never known Kevin to lie. Moreover, there is something I want you to know personally. Uh, You believe whatever you want about the way uh, you 
Hamhead with the, I can't read that, or did or do not do. Hall was a very sick man after he defeated Garrison's effort to force him to go to New Orleans to testify. After we spent some time together, he agreed to go voluntarily. This was my stated purpose when I interviewed him then uh, to get him to go voluntarily, but he agreed he wanted to go to be with him at all times, including uh, the connecting rooms under the circumstances, had I been Hall, I also uh, would have wanted a witness, someone to confirm my word, especially because of what I did not then know uh, Garrison bugged him. So I have no difficulty at all believing he, on his own, insisted on Kevin being with him, and great difficulty in understanding why your uh, spooks would not permit this. I know Hall. He would have talked to your people. He'd be crazy to now. And in, the, and in case those paranoids around you invent new rumors and believe them, if not repeat them, uh, the question of whether or not he would appear in September never came up. I did not offer advice either way, and he did not get and did not give any suggestion no matter how remote that he would not appear i rather look forward to it in part seeing that i have uh, guessed their choreography uh, purdy came up to me as i was leaving to say he wanted to speak to me later I said, okay. He said he wants to talk to me about the uh, medical evidence. I told him that for the committee, I will not do this now. Under the circumstances, I think it would be a waste of his time and mine. When I return from a trip that begins the day after tomorrow, I'll have more time pressure. I'd appreciate it if you tell him when you see him. Thank you. Uh, besides, there is a time and a place for everything. I offered all that and much, much more on a number of occasions before and after the committee. Donovan is aware of my conversation with Sprague on this, and he apparently was told not to come here as he asked, and I agreed. I now feel uh, if this part of my work was no interest to those who call themselves pros, and all other amateurs at a time when I believe it was basic and essential as a statement of the course and purpose of the committee. It is of no interest to me now that it has need to appear as what I think is not and will and cannot be. Mrs. Burka, meanwhile, has seen fit to refer me, refer to me as a son of a bitch. This causes me no anguish. The rest of what she said reflects an unwillingness to learn or to change. It also was untruthful. My reaction was not designed to flatter her, nor does she uh, lead me to believe I might want to rethink the position uh, to which I adhere, the one I made explicit on many occasions. I don't want to see Purdy, but I do not want him to take it personally. It is not personal, and it is not intended to be insulting. There are a couple of you I knew earlier and who I regarded as good people. Uh, on a matter of, of good people, others may believe any others on the committee to be, I just want nothing to do with any of them. I'm leaving on a trip shortly, and it has nothing to do with the committee or its work. Best wishes. So, Weisberg is kind of a fucking arrogant dick. I don't know if you've kind of put this together yet, but the guy thinks he knows everything. And he didn't know shit, right? Didn't know shit. All right. Let me see. We're going to move on to some articles. Uh, and then we're going to call it a day. Let me see. This one. Los Angeles Times, May 1st, 68. New facts on Kennedy death plot claimed. Figure in FBI probe says his information might boost conspiracy theory by Jerry Cohen. Sacramento, a figure in the Warren Commission investigation, told Governor Reagan's legal affairs secretary Tuesday he has information which may support the theory that the assassin of President John F. Kennedy resulted from a conspiracy. Lauren E. Hall's appearance before Edwin Meese in the Capitol building constituted a surprising reversal of position. Hall, who has resisted testifying in a controversial New Orleans investigation into the assassination, had uh, insisted in the past that he had no knowledge of a conspiracy to kill Mr. Kennedy. But he said his memory recently has been, quote, jogged by, quote, certain individuals reminding me of persons I was in contact with in 1963 before the assassination. Certain names supplied. He said he has supplied me the names of these, quote, certain individuals uh, I met uh, while making... Something in the Los Angeles area. I was raising funds for anti-Castro activities. Um, almost every occasion after I talk, uh, after I would talk at one of these events, Hall said I'd overhear people there discussing the possible assassination of Kennedy and how it might be done. Um, 
but also Chief Earl Warren and other government officials on how they had gotten rid of him, on how something they had gotten rid of. It's kind of cut off there. Uh, Hall, an adventurer who was once uh, a Castro prisoner, claims to have more than 50 meetings in California in the early 60s seeking support for anti-Castro guerrillas, of which he was. Uh, silent on meeting sites, he said that during speeches, uh, something expressed disappointment at President Kennedy's conduct of the Bay of Pigs incident, but never personally advocating harming him, uh, declined to specify the sites of meetings, but said he had applied Meese, he had supplied Meese with those he could remember. Uh, he said he had been given serious thought to New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison's demand he appear before a grand jury. Garrison's office has been in contact with me, and there is a chance I might reconsider about testifying in New Orleans, he said. But also that he had asked for the audience with Meese to protect myself in the event I do decide to go to New Orleans. He added, I felt uh, first I should give... Uh, any information that might be of value to a proper authority in California, and I decided the governor's legal affairs secretary was that proper authority. I don't actually know if what I had to tell Mr. Meese will be useful to anyone investigating the president's murder, but I felt if there's a chance it might be, I ought to tell him. Subpoena issued. Garrison issued a subpoena late last year for Hall, claiming he was in Dallas until the assassination and associated with Men in New Orleans, prosecutor contends, uh, plot led the assassination. But Hall produced a witness who established he was in California November 22nd, 1963, and a Bakersfield Superior Court judge uh, upheld his argument that he not be required to answer the garrison subpoena. Okay, so, the, so what I'm gathering is the airtight alibi was not the one where he was home with his wife, but it was the one with Robert Hudson at IPCO Hospital Supply, which ends up getting crumbling later on. Hall also denied knowing any of the alleged conspirators, including North Hollywood man Edgar Eugene Bradley, a position he apparently now has retreated from. Uh, he said after his memory recently was refreshed about events in 1963 and faces I encountered, he appeared before another Bakersfield judge April 13th and was assured his previous testimony uh, would not make him liable to a perjury charge. It was then he said that he decided to go to Meese after hearing... Hall's story, Meese declined uh, to comment on it. Uh, story studied. The Warren Commission investigation focused on Hall, but only briefly and then inconclusively in the very late stages of the 1964 inquiry, which found Lee Harvey Oswald to be the lone assassin. He figured in it because investigators wanted to tie up something, something disturbance held, uh, oh, the, uh, the, in, the something at Mrs. Sylvia Odio's, then 26-year-old refugee from Castro's Cuba. Mrs. Odio told FBI her Dallas apartment had been visited in late September 1963 by three men seeking her help in anti-Castro activity. One, she said, was introduced to her as Leon Oswald, a man described by one of his companions as a crack marksman who favored assassinating Mr. Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs failure. After the assassination, Mrs. Odio said she saw a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald flash on television she recognized him as one of her three visitors, then fainted. Name submitted. The commission asked the FBI to try to find the three men in an attempt to determine if her story had substance. The FBI came up with Hall's name. The commission concluded that because of the contradictions in what Hall told the FBI and its own evidence that Oswald was elsewhere on that date, Oswald could not have been one of the three men who visited Mrs. Odio's apartment. However, the incident still troubles critics of the Warren Commission report, not least the uh, of the wisdom of D D District Attorney Jim Garrison. Garrison has charged New Orleans civic leader Clay L. Sean Bradley with conspiring to kill Kennedy. He also said that Oswald and the late David W. Ferry and New Orleans Eccentric were part of the plot. Yes, indeed. See, to me, it's just so obvious what happened at Sylvia Odio's. And that puts into place everything that happened in Mexico City and where Oswald was and all that stuff. It's really fucking wild that these idiots couldn't put this shit together. It's really not that fucking hard, people. I hope that you listening out there to, to all the stuff we've covered can see that it wasn't really that fucking hard, right? Not that fucking hard to put these idiots on the fucking sixth floor of the depository. All right, Times Picayune, New Orleans, 5268. 
Hall, quote, may help Garrison case. Reverses stand in JFK probe, LA Times. The Los Angeles Times reported Wednesday that a key witness sought in District Attorney Jim Garrison's assassination probe has, reser- has reversed his uh, position and admitted that he may have information which could support the theory that a conspiracy to murder President John F. Kennedy. The newspaper said Lauren E. Hall, who had been subject uh, or subpoenaed to appear before the Orleans Parish Grand Jury in connection with the probe, changed his position in an appearance before the uh, before Edwin Meese, California Governor Ronald Reagan's legal affairs and extradition secretary. The story was written by former New Orleans uh, New Orleans Jerry Cohen and stated that Hall had his memory jogged by certain individuals who reminded him of persons he was in contact with in '63, before Kennedy was assassinated. Hall had previously insisted he knew nothing about a conspiracy to kill the president and had successfully fought Garrison subpoena in the California courts. Hall reportedly met Meese Tuesday in Sacramento and handed over to the governor's aide a list of names of certain individuals reminding him of persons he met while making speeches in the Los Angeles area for raising funds for anti-Castro activities. Hall was quoted as saying he was in touch with Meese to protect himself in case he decides to go to New Orleans to testify. He said he's been giving serious thought to appearing in New Orleans Hall claimed he spoke at more than 50 meetings in Southern California in the 1960s. Seeking support for anti-Castro guerrillas, a former prisoner of Fidel Castro, Hall said he overheard people discussing the possibility of assassinating Kennedy and how it might be done after he finished talking at most of the meetings. So let's just see if we can analyze Hall's behavior here. Hall, guilty, a shooter on the sixth floor of the book depository, most likely the man who shot Governor Conley. Um, he is now attempting to come forward saying, oh yes, I might have information and it might have been these guys who I heard over, I overheard at these, uh, meetings that I was at. This is a devil's bargain he's trying to make. I hope you can see the desperation of Hall over this time period from after the assassination in 64 till when his name popped up in the Warren Commission at the end of the Warren Commission in 64, all the way through the stuff here in 68. So he got four years, he's sweating. He is sweating and he's changing his story and he's moving around the country and he's avoiding subpoenas. Does that sound like the, does that sound like the behavior of someone who's innocent? No, not at all. Let's see what else we have. All right, let's do one more. Art- let's do one more of these little articles and then we'll be done for the day. Okay. Hall's memory is refreshed, has new information, says Garrison. <laughs> it's so funny because he was interviewed about being at Sylvia Odeo's and he spilled the beans. And then a couple days later, he's like, oh, yeah, now that my memory is refreshed, I wasn't there. Right. So he's, he's like a master of uh, remember, He's a master of this twisted word. Uh, Hall's memory is refreshed, has new information, says Garrison. Los Angeles, California, a California bartender, sought in the Kennedy assassination probe of New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison, says he has other information which Garrison might use about a meeting one month before the November 1963 shooting of the president. Lauren E. Hall also told a news conference that he won't fight extradition from California to New Orleans. He explained that he has refreshed his memory after meeting with Edgar Eugene Bradley, age 49. Hall and Bradley, accused by Garrison of conspiracy in the murder, are scheduled to appear at an extradition hearing June 5th in Sacramento. Hall said that three attempts have been made on his life since his name was made public by Garrison. Hall said uh, he saw Bradley uh, during a meeting in, in San Fernando in November 1963 and heard casual talk of getting rid of Kennedy. Hall said Bradley was not part of the discussion. The meeting was at a private home, he said, to raise funds and equip guerrillas with arms for the, an invasion of Cuba. He said, quote, some anti-Jewish and anti-Negro radicals attended the gathering. However, Bradley told newsmen that, it, that he does not recall meeting Hall. I will take a lie detector test on this, uh, Bradley said. This is an absolute false statement. It is interesting that Hall would come up with this, a statement like this. He was obviously well coached and doing it for an ulterior motive. Absolutely. Absolutely. He was well coached and doing it for an ulterior motive. Uh, let me see. All right. I'll read this one and then we'll call it a day. This one's interesting. It says Hall not involved in JFK plot, which is obviously bullshit. Dated 5-11-68 in the state's item. 
District Attorney Jim Garrison says that Lauren Hall of Los Angeles, California, is not personally connected with the events surrounding the assassination of President Kennedy. The DA, who had earlier subpoenaed Hall as a material witness in his investigation of the assassination, said yesterday that his office talked with Hall here at considerable length. It is apparent that Hall was in no way personally connected with the events culminating in the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas, Garrison said. However, the DA charged Hall's name purposely was injected into the Warren Commission report so that any effort to investigate the assassination would cause his name to appear. Where elements of a professional intelligence agency execute an assassination, as was the case in the murder of President Kennedy, the operation includes not only setting up of a decoy like Lee Harvey Oswald, but the creation of artificial leads pointing to persons who are actually not involved. Garrison said that although Hall was not connected with the assassination, he is a helpful witness because of his extensive experience in anti- uh, Cuban raids from Florida in the early 1960s. We want to make public our appreciation of Lauren Hall's uh, cooperation, Hall's genuine concern about the assassination of President Kennedy and about the subsequent concealment of the truth was apparent and our office is indebted to him for his help in the investigation, Garrison concluded. And Garrison, God, Jim, you got it wrong. You got it wrong, Jim. You had him right in your hands. You had him in your midst. Who else did you have in your midst? David Ferry, another shooter. And you let him slip through your hands too. And that's going to do it for today, guys. Uh, if you haven't bought the book yet, uh, please hit, hit, hit me up directly and you can buy an autographed copy. Uh, and uh, if you want to get one on Amazon, you can get one there too. We'll be back tomorrow where we will be uh, exploring uh, the 100-page file on Lawrence Howard that was collected by John Armstrong. And so... That'll do it for today, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks.